recordings. That's good. So, uh, before I forget, this is the row sheet for CISP 310. There, we go. there are certain places I cannot you know, stand around, like about here, you know, because of the feedback. <clears throat> All right, so how are you guys doing in CISP 310? The homework assignment, it's all good? Okay. Yeah, this one is pretty easy, you know, uh, especially if you watch the video from last Thursday and then think about what I said on Tuesday and just kind of gnaw on it a little bit and go like, mm, okay, how do I make connections between these two things, these things? All right, that's all good. Then you switch to CISP 310. And we'll continue to talk about comparison. Okay, and because comparison is actually kind of tricky when you're dealing with signed numbers. So what we'll do first is I'm gonna use my uh, notepad here to compare a few numbers. Okay, we'll take a look at the result of these comparisons. And then we'll say, well, do we see any patterns? You know, do we see any patterns when we can say, oh, if this is a zero, that is a one, then the first number is greater than the second number, or something along that line, okay? So we'll try to spot, you know, um, rules that we can use. So we'll go through a few comparisons, but these are signed comparisons, okay? We only want to deal with signed comparisons. Um, let's start with uh, comparing zero to one, okay? In other words, we want to find out, okay, zero is blah, 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 one. Now, of course, we already know zero is less than one, okay? But we want to go through the binary uh, subtraction so that we can see the big pattern of the result of zero minus one because we want to see if we can spot certain patterns after doing a few examples, okay? All right, so this example is zero, 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 so I'm gonna use four bits in uh, all of these examples, uh, minus one, right, zero, 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 one, and we kind of know the result already, but we'll go through the step-by-step -step process to get to it. All right. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus zero is a one. This is gonna be the story for almost every single row is zero minus zero is a zero. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. So we can pretty much just do exactly the same thing for all the rows. And to get to the last one, then we have one extra borrow. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So we say, okay, that's good. And then we look at another subtraction where the first number is less than the second number. But this time we'll use something that is negative. So we'll say, what about negative one? Negative one is blah, blah, one. Well, we already know negative one is also less than one as a negative value, right? But we want to go through the binary subtraction and then look at the big patterns and go like, well, do they share anything in common, can we use anything as a conclusion and say, oh, we, we can use that as an indication. So let's check it out. Negative one is represented by which bit pattern again? From the previous class? One, 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 one. One, 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 okay. So one, 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 one represents negative one as a signed number. Zero, 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 one is just one itself. So when you go through the subtraction, um, there won't be, I'm just gonna shortcut this because it's not a, as challenging as the other one. So we end up with no overall borrow, and then the end result is one, 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 zero. Okay, is that making any sense? Is that okay? All right, okay. So we apparently, we see some pattern here, and we can say, oh, look at this bit here, okay? And look at this bit here. If that bit is a one, which turns out to be our sign bit, if that bit is a one, the first number is less than the second number when numbers are interpreted in a signed manner. It seems that way, doesn't it? We know that the borrow flag is useless already because in the first one, the borrow flag is a one. In the second case, the borrow flag is a zero. We cannot rely on the borrow flag. 
but the sine flag seems to be reliable because in the first subtraction, the sine flag is a one. Let me re-emphasize what is a sine flag. The sine flag is the most significant bit of the result, which is this one here. Okay, this is a one, this is a one, seems to be consistent. So now we'll compare two numbers and they're both negative values. Go ahead and compare, uh, I don't know, negative 2 and negative 1. So negative 2 is blah, blah, negative 1. Well, we already know negative 2 is less than negative 1. So let's go through the subtraction here. So we have um, 1, 1, 1, 0, which is negative 2, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, which is negative 1. And what do we end up with? Zero here. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. And one minus zero is a one. Okay, the first one is zero minus one, I think I might have misspoke. One minus one is a zero. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus one is a zero again. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. 1 minus 1 is a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. Hmm. OK, well, looks like the sine flag is pretty reliable to me. So here comes here's my question to you. Can someone come up with a subtraction where the signed representation, or the signed interpretation, I should say, the signed interpretation of the first number is less than the sign interpretation of the second number. And yet, in the result, you will have a zero for the bit that has the blinky cursor right now. Okay. Let, me, let me just rephrase the question in this form. Okay. So I want some kind of number minus some kind of number here. I'm going to use the long subtraction format. But I want, it, I want to end up with a zero here. But I want the value, in the, the value represented by the first bit pattern to be less than the uh, value represented by the second pattern. Can someone come up with an, ex come up with an example? Come, think about the extreme cases, OK? Think about the last value, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Negative one is not even close to the last value. Okay, it's the first negative value. It's not the last one. One is not the last one either. It's the first. Uh, well, it's not the first, but it's the second non-negative number. It's not the last one. Think about the last ones. What can you think of? What about negative eight? Negative eight is the smallest value you can represent using four bits. Do you guys remember the number wheel thing? Okay. okay. Let me just redraw the number wheel, but in a quick way. Okay. This is the num number wheel. This is zero, and opposite to zero is negative eight. Seven is right here. Negative one is here. One is here. Negative seven is here. Do you remember the the number circle? So negative eight is the most negative value that you represent. It has a representation of 1, 0, 0, 0. So let's see what happens when we compare negative 8 with something else. Negative 8 being the first number, and we'll subtract something from it. From this, from this wheel, you can already kind of tell that something is going to go wrong. Because any subtraction is basically having our pointer you know, continue to rotate counterclockwise. But since negative 8 is the most negative value already, if you subtract 1 from negative 8, you get to 7, which doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, So we'll go through the subtraction and then see what happens with the bits. Right, So we have 1, 0, 0, 0, which is representing negative 8 because we are using the signed interpretation of these bits. We'll just compare it to 1. 0, 0, 0, 1, and that is representing the value of 1 itself. Okay. And we all know that negative 8 is less than 1. Okay, That's not a, a no-brainer. But when we go through the calculations, okay, we'll go through the calculations here. There's always a 0 here. 
Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus zero is a one. Zero minus zero is a zero. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. Zero minus zero is a zero. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus zero. One minus zero is a one. One minus one is a zero, and it has no borrow. Oh, it broke all the rules, right? Everything that we have observed up to this point, it doesn't work, right? Because if you look at the most significant bit of the result, we thought if it was a one, then we can make a conclusion that the first number is less than the second. Until we get to this one, then go, ah, it doesn't work anymore. We look at the borrow flag. We learned long ago that the borrow flag itself is not reliable. So it doesn't seem like we have any consistent way to confirm that the first number is less than the second number, just by using these four examples. And that's because we are we have to introduce another flag, another you know, single bit, in order to finish this discussion. So the one extra flag with which we have not talked about up to this point is called the overflow flag. Instead of just using O, you know, I would try to use OV, you know, so this way it is more obvious this is the overflow flag and not just you know zero itself. The overflow flag is a one, okay, when if and only if, okay, if and only if the sign of the result makes no sense. Okay. So let's look at this statement and see what it means. The overflow from flag is asserted, meaning it is a one or true, if and only if the sign of the result doesn't make any sense. That's our last case here. In our last case, negative eight is a negative number. You're subtracting a non-negative value from a negative value, but your result end up, ends up to be what? Non-negative. No, no, what, what? it's not zero. The result is zero, one, 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 which you look up on the uh, number circle here, and that is representing the value seven. I don't even care about the value. Negative value minus non-negative value, ending up with a positive value or non-negative value, doesn't make any sense. So I want the overflow flag to be a one in this case. What about all of the other cases? Well, let's check. So I'm going to make a conclusion here, and I will say the overflow flag is the one in this case, because the sign of the result makes no sense. What about this one here? Okay, We have negative 2 minus negative 1, and the result is negative 1. Does the sign make any sense? If the sign makes sense, the overflow flag is going to be a 0. Good. Let's check the one before that. We are subtracting one from negative one, and we end up with the big pattern representing negative two. Is does, does the sign of the result make any sense? Make sense? So the overflow flag is going to be a zero. Let's look at the first case. We have one more case at the very beginning. So the first case is zero minus one ending up with negative one. If I subtract a non-negative value from a non-negative value, ending up with a negative value, does the sign make sense? Yeah. Wait, no. Non-negative value minus non-negative value can end up either way. You can end up with a non-negative value, you can end up with a negative value. Either way is possible. So the sign makes sense in this case. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Are you recording this time? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. I think I checked already, and also making sure the audio is the portion is is actually being recorded. Otherwise, it should became a silent movie. Yes, as opposed to no movie at all. Yes. No, no cut. Okay, so, okay, the overflow flag seems to be interesting, but then you can see, hey, sometimes it's a one, other times it's a zero, 
um, oh, forgot this one, there's a zero too, but it's still not consistent, right? It's not consistent because when the first number or the value of the first number is less than the value of the second number, sometimes it is a zero and other times it's a one. Doesn't seem to work either. So what do you think? Do we see any patterns? If you can look at the combination of bits, not just one individual bit now. When you look at the combination of bits, do you see some a particular pattern when the first number is less than the second number? So let's 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 just uh, list everything here. Okay, the overflow flag is a one. The sign flag, which is the most significant bit of the result here, is a zero. Right. And the borrow flag is also a zero. In this case, the overflow flag is a zero, the sign flag is a one, the borrow flag is a one. In this case, the overflow flag is a zero, the sign flag is a one, the borrow flag is a zero. And the last one, which is our first one here, is the overflow flag is a zero, the sign flag is a one, and the borrow flag is a one in this case. So let me just copy and paste all of this stuff here. So it's easier to read. This is our first case. And here's our second case. Third case is this one. And the last one is this one here. I think I copied the wrong. Yep. Can you repeat exactly what makes the overflowed flag trip? Okay. The overflow flag, okay, from the semantics perspective, you know, from our perspective, the overflow flag is a one when the sign of the result does not make any sense. Can you be any more analytical than that? Um, when you subtract a non-negative value from a negative value and ending up with a non-negative value, then it makes no sense. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So when you look at these four rows from line 43 to line 46, do we see any pattern that we can kind of say, well, maybe we can run with that and use that as a pattern of the first number being less than the second number? There was a borrow bit zero and the most significant bit zero. Okay, but we can see that you know the that pattern is broken because you know in this case the sign flag is a one, the borrow flag is a zero. In this case, the sign flag is a one, the borrow flag is a zero, and we have a third one here, which is the sign flag being a zero and the borrow flag is a is a zero. The sign and the overflow. How do they relate to each other? Opposites. Okay. Okay, so we are onto something here. You are onto something here. So what kind of expression do you think we can use to indicate, oh, the overflow flag is different from the sign flag? Which Boolean operator can we use? Or not. Or is closed. Not or. Exclusive or. Okay, it's exclusive or. Okay, so when we say overflow, exclusive or, sign, that becomes a made up flag, I just call it the L flag for less than. When the first number is less than the second number, then this flag is always going to be a one. Is that okay? Well, just because it works out for less than doesn't mean that it works out all the time. You know, maybe it will give us, let's see, false positive. In other words, when the first number is not less than the second number, are we sure that the L flag would also be a zero automatically? Because I haven't shown you a single case where the first number is not less than the second number. So let's check out those cases first. Awesome. Okay. Well, those are pretty easy cases to work out because we just have to flip, you know, all of these things around, right? So we will work out the first one, which is comparing one to zero. So it will go ahead and say, what is one minus zero? We all know this one, you know, I don't think we we'll have to go through the exercise to find out the answer. One minus zero, 
is just one with no borrow. Okay, so if that is the case, what is the conclusion? What about the overall full fact? In other words, does the sign of the result, the difference, make sense? I subtract a non-negative value from a non-negative value, ending up with a non-negative value. Is that okay? Sounds okay to me. So the overall flag is going to be a zero. What about the sign flag, which is the most significant bit of the result? It's a zero. What about the borrow flag? It's also a zero. Okay. So that's okay. That seems to be consistent. Because in this case, the zero exclusive or zero is a zero. Okay, exclusive or basically says well, if they're different, then you get a one. Okay, let's look at the second case. Our original second case is this one here. So the new one is going to be one minus negative one. So we want to check out one minus negative one and see what happens. So with this one, I'm going to do it the long way because you know this one does involve you know some carrying and propagation of the, the borrow, not carry the borrow. There we go. One minus one, uh, that's easy. That's a zero. Zero minus a zero is a zero. Neither will contribute a borrow of one, so it's a zero. A borrow of zero from the next column. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus zero is a one, and that's going to be the story for all the other bits too. Zero minus one is a one, and with a borrow. Zero, one, excuse me, one minus one is a zero. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus one is a zero. Okay. Now we look at all the flags. Um, are we having an overflow situation here? I am subtracting a negative value from a non-negative value, ending up with a non-negative value. Does that make sense? What happens when you subtract a not uh, when you subtract a negative value? You're just adding, right? You're adding a non-negative value. So when the sign here is non-negative, does it make sense? Maybe. 1 minus negative 1 is 2. Does that make sense? It makes sense because we have we are, we are not crossing this border. Okay, As long as we're not crossing this border, we are fine. In other words, if we add, we don't end up from going, we, we don't end up going from 7 to negative 8, we're good. When we're subtracting, if we don't end up going from negative 8 to 7, we're good. Okay, so we don't have any overflow here. The sign flag is a zero, the borrow, the borrow flag is one. Let's look at the third case. The third case is negative two, negative one, so this time we'll subtract negative two from negative one. This is negative two, this is negative one, and we'll go through the subtraction. All right, zero minus one is a one with a borrow, 1 minus 0 is a 1. 1 minus 1 is a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 1 minus 1 is a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 minus 1 is 1 with an extra borrow. All right, so let's, let's ask those questions again. Do we have an overflow situation here? We are subtracting a negative value from another negative value, ending up with a negative value. Can that happen? Yes. Yeah, it can happen. So the sign makes sense, and overflow is a zero. But the sign flag is a one in this case. The borrow flag is also a one. Let's look at the last one. The last case is comparing negative eight to one, negative eight minus one. So what we'll do now is to reverse it and just say, okay, what if we have one minus negative eight. Okay, so we'll find out what happens in this case. All right, let's work this out. This is a pretty easy one. One minus zero is a one. One minus zero is a one. 
neither has any borrow. Zero minus zero is a zero. Zero minus zero is a zero. Neither has a borrow. Zero minus zero is a zero. Zero minus zero is a zero. Doesn't have a borrow. Zero minus one is a one with a borrow. One minus zero is a one. Okay. So let's look at the overflow flag. Does the sign make any sense? I am subtracting a negative value from a non-negative value, ending up with a negative value. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Any time you subtract a negative value, you are really adding a non-negative value. You're adding a positive value, right? If you add a positive value to a non-negative value, you should always end up with a non-negative value. But yet, yet, in this case, it is negative. It doesn't make any sense. Overflow is a one. What about the sign flag? It's also a one. The borrow flag is a one. Okay, let's check our rules, okay? The rule is, if the exclusive or between the overflow flag and the sign flag is a one, the first number is less than the second number. Let's see if this is all okay here. Zero, exclusive, or zero is zero. Um, so the first number is not less than the second number. Is that really the case? One is not less than zero. Okay, that's good. Move on to the second one. Okay, same situation. Zero, zero, and, oh, I might have made a mistake here. Yes, I did. I forgot to flip the order, sorry. So when we get to that one, that will be perfect. Okay, but the second one is the same situation. The borrow flag is the one that is changed, but when you look at the sign, uh, the sign flag and the overflow flag, the exclusive or of those two bits is a zero, which means the first number is not less than the second number. It works out for the second case too. This one I goofed up because I forgot to change the order of those two numbers because it really should be this. Okay, this, this is what it is supposed to be. So let's work out this math here. I do. All right. One minus zero is a one. One minus zero is a one. There's no bar. And then the rest are pretty easy. Zero, one minus one is a zero. Zero minus zero is a zero. One minus one is a zero. Zero minus zero is a zero, no borrow. One minus one is of a zero, zero minus zero is a zero, and no borrow. Okay, so now that we have the actual correct result, let's check out you know, these flags here. Let's, let me just delete every single one, and then we'll work on this again. Okay. Do we have an overflow situation? If I subtract a negative value from a negative value, ending up with a non-negative value, can that happen? Yes. Yeah, because in this case, we have one, negative one minus negative two being a one. That makes perfect sense to me, okay? So that means the overflow flag is gonna be a zero. The sign flag, which is the most significant bit of the result, is also a zero. The borrow is a zero in this case. But what I really want to look at is the exclusive or between the overflow flag and the sign flag. Zero, exclusive, or zero is zero. So the L flag, the less than flag, is a zero, which means the first number is not less than the second number. Negative one is not less than negative two. Is that right? It's right, okay? Okay, so it works out up to this point. Let's check out the last one. The last one is a non-negative value minus a negative value ending up with a negative value. Does that make any sense? Nope, does not make any sense. So the overflow flag is a one, the sign flag is a one, the borrow flag is a one, but most importantly, what is one exclusive or one? Because the L flag, which is indicating the first number is less than the second number, is the exclusive or between the overflow and the sign flag. So. In this case, what is one exclusive or is it one? It's zero, which means the first number is not less than the second number. Everything works out. 
I have missed one really important test case. Which one is it? <coughs> No, you cannot. You, you, there's no eight. Negative eight is taking that spot already. So one zero 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 cannot represent eight in signed interpretation. Well, eight. Hmm? Huh? Eight minus seven. No, you cannot use eight. Oh. <laughs> you can use negative eight, but not eight. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But you want to use seven, okay? That's a that's a good idea, okay? We can use seven, okay? So if you use seven, what can trigger this, you know, uh, overflow situation? But we are not adding though. <laughs> but there are something that we can do to trigger. Hmm? We can subtract negative one from seven, okay? Let's see what happens. Now this time I'm going to do it the opposite way, which means you know I will write out the whole thing. We have seven minus negative one. Oops, minus one. No, minus <coughs> negative one. That's it. Okay. We already know what the result is supposed to be. It should be okay. Seven minus negative one is eight. The representation of eight, unfortunately, is the same as negative eight. But we know the first number is not less than the second number, don't we? Right? Is that okay? Okay, so let's see whether we can work out the math here. Even, be, even before we derive the actual answer. The open full flag is going to be a what? Okay, so in this case we have a non-negative number minus a negative number ending up with a negative number. So does the sign of the result make sense? No, it does not make sense, which means the overflow flag is going to be a one. The sign flag is a one because it is just this one here. And then the borrow flag is not even important because this is a signed comparison. But if we already know that the borrow flag is a one too. Okay, so that works out. And if you really want to carry out the subtraction, 0 minus 1 is a 1, the rest of those are zeros, and we don't have any borrow for the entire thing, except for the most significant bit. No? So if you want to actually carry out the entire subtraction, that's what it looks like. What about the flip side of that? Negative 1 minus 7. We haven't done that yet. Okay, let's check it out. So we have negative 1 minus 7. And let's check out the result. Okay. 1 minus 1, okay. We can just do it using the half subtractor approach. So this whole row is going to be that, right? No one needs to borrow anything, so the entire row of borrows will be zeros. And we end up with this result with no overall borrow. Okay. Can someone tell me what is the overflow flag? We are subtracting a non-negative value from a negative value. We end up with a negative value. Does the sign make sense? The sign makes sense. Okay. So overflow flag is a zero. The sign flag is a one because we have one, a one for the most significant bit of the result. The borrow flag is a zero. The L flag is the exclusive or between the overflow and the sign flags. Zero exclusive or one is one. So that means the first number is less than the second number. Is that really the case? Is negative one less than seven? Yep, so that works out too. Right, so now we can kind of define what the L flag is, well, which I have already stated a little bit up here. The L flag, or the less than flag, is the overflow flag, exclusive or with the sign flag. But how do we define the overflow flag? Now, I gave you an English description earlier. 
that the overflow flag is a one if and only if the sign of the result does not make any sense. You tell that in the transistors. Okay. Okay, do you guys get the point? Mm -hmm. The transistors don't understand, oh, the sign doesn't make any sense because the transistors don't even understand the subtraction. It doesn't understand when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. But what can we do instead? What do you think computers natively understand? We can build what out of transistors? Logic gates. Circuits, but to be more specific, logic gates. We can have and or not, that sort of thing, right? So can we express the overflow flag as some kind of crazy Boolean expression of the other bits? Heck yeah. Hmm? Heck yeah. Well, I surely hope so, right? <laughs> Because otherwise, we don't know what is inside all of our computers. Magical beings and stuff. That's what I always guess. <laughs> Miniaturized unicorns. OK, so let's see what we can do with the overflow flag. Now, to understand how to derive the overflow flag, what we need to do is to look at a subtraction like this. A, whatever, minus B, whatever ends up with C, whatever. Okay. The overflow flag can now be expressed as some kind of crazy Boolean formula based on A, B, C. The negations, conjunctions, disjunctions, you know, apply those things. So the question is, how do we make this happen? Good job. Truth table would be quite useful. Okay. So let's check out the truth table. So we have A, B, C. They are not independent variables. Okay? What, do, what, what does it mean when something is independent? As an independent, independent variable. What, what does that mean? Exactly. The value of that variable does not depend on the rest. Okay? But out of these three, Two are independent, the third one is not. Which one is not independent? C, exactly. C is the result of the subtraction, so it is not exactly independent. Okay, very good. But that would still give us two independent variables. So that would be A, so A can be zero, can be one. B can also be zero, can be one. Can be zero, can be one. Now, but C can also be, as a result of the subtraction, can also assume zeros and ones. So the actual truth table will need, need to be a little bit more expanded. Turn off the line number because it's making it a little bit harder to read. That. Zero, one, zero. Right there. Okay. So now we want to look at just the overflow flag based on our un understanding of subtraction. Non-negative minus non-negative getting a non-negative. Does it make sense? Which means overflow is going to be a zero. Okay. Um, non-negative minus non-negative getting a negative. Can that happen? Yeah, it can. 1 minus 2 is negative, right? So that is okay. Um, here we have non-negative minus negative getting a non-negative. Is that okay? Come on, you guys know. We, already we have already covered this case. Yeah. It, it's fine, okay? Because zero minus negative one is one. Okay, that's one example. Okay. Oh, what about this one? Non-negative minus negative getting a negative result. Does the sign make sense? The sign of the result. Nope, does not make sense. Overflow is a one. Okay. Negative minus non-negative getting a non-negative. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, let me say that one more time. 
You start with a negative number. You subtract a non-negative number from it. And the result is non-negative. Does that make sense? Does not make sense. Okay, so the overflow flag is a one. Okay, there we go. All right, so I think the rest you know, should be fairly easy. Negative minus non-negative is negative. Makes perfect sense. Okay, that's the way it should be. Negative minus no negative is non-negative. It, it can happen, we saw that. Negative one minus negative two is one. Okay, so the sign makes sense. Overflow is a zero. And this one is a zero as well because we can have negative two minus negative one is negative one. So they're all negative. So result makes sense. Overflow is a zero. Okay, so what do you notice? When, when does overflow become a one? Only on two rows. Okay. Now, if there are only two rows that make overflow true, what is the quickest and easiest way to derive that formula? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. We use DNF, where one conjunction represents one row. Okay, how many people still remember what is DNF? Disjunctive normal form, right? And as a disjunctive normal form, in this case, each conjunction inside the disjunction is going to represent one row. Okay, so we'll end up with two rows, and one each row is its own conjunction. So now the question is: Oh, I want this. I want overflow to be a one when A is false, B is true, C is true. How can I make a conjunction expression out of that? Well, if this is a conjunction, that means A has to be negated. Because if A is false, then the negation of A is true. But B is already true, C is already true. So not A, B, C, or not A conjunction B conjunction C, or not A and B and C, is going to be true to handle the first row when the overflow flag is a 1. Is that OK? Well, then the second one is kind of the same thing, except we kind of flip everything around a little bit. Because the second row has A being a 1, and I want the conjunction to be a 1, so A, I will just take it by itself. But B is false, B is a 0, C is a 0, but I want the entire thing to be true, so I need to negate B, and I also need to negate C. That's the equation. That is the Boolean expression for the overflow flag in subtraction. Addition has its own rules, but this is this works for subtraction. Are we still doing okay? Sort of. I thought yes. it'd be a lot harder than that. Hmm? I thought it would be a lot harder than that. Well, it is just that. Yeah. There might be another way to express it, but this is the usual way that people used to express it. All right. So looking at this expression, do you think we can build gates to do this? Yep. yep. And if you look at the L flag, okay, let's take a look at the L flag itself. The L flag is the overflow flag exclusive or the sign flag, right? But the sign flag is, re is really which one here? Which bit are we talking about is the sign of the result? Bit C, exactly. So now we can combine these, okay, because the overflow flag is just this thing here, and then we have the exclusive or C. And we already know that you know when you want to expand exclusive or, but only use negation and conjunction and disjunction, it becomes a big mess. But we only we know how to do this already because of the previous homework assignments. So but I'll so I'll just kind of leave it as this. But this is the L flag, it indicates whether the first number is less than the second number in signed interpretation. Okay, if you interpret the bits as signed numbers, this will indicate whether the first number is less than the second number. Any questions? I have a question. If all we can tell is whether the first number is less than the second number, then what about Less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, 
equal to and not equal to, how do we deal with those? Well, equal to, we already have one flag to deal with it. At the end of the previous class, I talked about that, mm -hmm. right? So the Z flag can do that. But what about the other ones? What about greater than, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to? What do, how, what do we deal with those? Can we use combinations of the L flag and the Z flag to deal with that? Yes. Yes? OK. So let's see how we can do that. So now we have you know, A and B as two numbers. So the question is, uh, when A is less than B, both are signed numbers. What kind of bit patterns are we talking about? Uh, when A is less than or equal to B, when A is greater than B, when A is greater than or equal to B, and well, we'll just deal with these uh, few ones. Okay, this is the easy one. L is one because that's the whole purpose of L in this life. Okay, this is the the purpose of the L flag is whether the first number is less than the second number. So when A is less than B, L has to be a one. Ah, but what about the Z flag? What do we know? about the Z flag when L flag is a 1. It's got to be a 0, okay? Because they cannot be equal to. Because a number cannot be less than and equal to another number. Okay, so I have to say and, okay? What about when A is less than or equal to B? How do we express it in terms of the L flag and the Z flag? The L flag can be a 1 or the Z flag can be a 1. So this will express less than or equal to. Is that OK? What about greater than? How do we express greater than? If A is greater than B after a comparison, how do we confirm that? But only using the L flag and the Z flag. L flag is a 0. And Z flag is a zero as well. Right? What about greater than or equal to? The L flag has to be a zero, or the Z flag is a one. So by playing with these two bits, we can come up with the other conclusions of a comparison. Are we still doing okay so far? What about equal to? I'll just kind of throw this in here. A equals B. How do we express that? How do we know that A and B are exactly the same? I don't even care about the L flag because all I really need to know is the Z flag is a one. Because that's the whole purpose of the Z flag is to tell me whether those two numbers are the same or not. I'll also give you the last one here, which is just A does not equal to B. Well, okay, fine. Well, it could be consistent and use C notation. Okay, what about this one? How do I confirm that A does not equal to B or A is different from B? Which bit combination will accomplish that? Do we care about the L flag? No. Nope. So the L flag can be whatever. Okay, I don't care. What about the Z flag? Zero. Has to be a zero. There you go. But since we don't care about the L flag, might as well just not mention it, right? So there we go. So now we have you know the six possible conclusion after you compare two numbers. And we can get all six combinations on all six conclusions using only the L and the Z flag. Okay. Any questions? This is only for signed comparison. What about unsigned comparison? We have been focusing so much on signed interpretation that we are kind of forgetting about the unsigned numbers. What about the unsigned numbers? Okay, so I'm gonna put title here and just say for signed comparison. These are the conclusions. Okay. What about for unsigned comparison? Okay, for unsigned comparison, we don't use the L flag. So we know the L needs to go, right? The L needs to go, 
Instead, which flag do we pay attention to? Hmm? Well, the Z flag is still useful, but the Z flag can only tell you whether something equals or not. It cannot establish the order. Which, um, which flag is useful to establish the order when you're dealing with unsigned comparison? The borrow flag, very good. The, the flag that we have, what do call forgotten to now. So we just go, we just use the B flag as if it is the L flag when we perform unsigned comparison. Or when we want to know the result of an unsigned comparison, we pay attention to the B or the borrow flag instead of the L flag. Any questions? Okay, once again, when we compare, when we subtract, do we care whether the numbers are signed or not when we subtract? No, we do not, okay? In the subtraction process, it is the same whether you're dealing with signed numbers or unsigned numbers. It's only when you need to determine the ordering of the numbers, then you have to say, oh, should I be using the L flag because these things are supposed to be representing signed numbers, or should I be using the borrow flag because these things are representing unsigned numbers? That is the time when you need to really think about of, of, of signed versus unsigned. But when you subtract, it's the same. Yep. So like if you're subtracting five minus three, you're gonna be using the borrow flag. And if you're subtracting like no. to get it to no, no, but five and three, even as a formal number, they, it, they can be signed or unsigned. Okay, how do you know, how do you determine as a programmer, okay? How do you determine whether a C, C++ variable should be int or unsigned? Depends on, huh? Depends on the data, okay, but what about the data? What about, yeah? Depends on the domain. Do, depends on the domain, the, 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 the range of values that the variable has to store. So a lot of times, sign, you know, int versus unsigned will both work, okay? Because you're counting from zero to 10, okay? You know, as a 32-bit number, you can use either. But the moment you have to represent negative values, you have no choice anymore. You have to use signed representation, right? So when do you use unsigned explicitly? What drives the decision in the program to say, oh, I want this variable to be unsigned? Like a loop? Like a loop? Okay. But you can use int in that. You can also use int in some cases, too. Right. It has a higher positive range. So it has a higher positive range because it goes up to four billion something instead of two billion something. So when you know that you're dealing with thirty-two bit numbers and the value will go to about three billion, then you have no choice but to say this has to be an unsigned number. Okay. Now this is where the big disconnect is between C and C plus plus, which is what you already know as opposed to assembly language programming, we haven't started yet. In C and C++, when do you throw the signedness into your program? When you declare, okay? When you declare a variable, you say int, which is implicitly signed, or you can say unsigned, which is explicitly unsigned. That, at that moment, okay, the name of that variable is now associated with either signed or unsigned. That's in C and C++. In assembly language programming, throughout the, 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 the entire program, we don't care about sign versus unsigned. When you compare, the compare instruction, which is a subtraction instruction, doesn't care, okay? There's one single subtraction instruction for sign and unsigned uh, values. <laughs> it's only when you need to make a decision based on the conclusion of a comparison then you have to say, oh, which flags should I look at? Should I look at the L flag or should I look at the B flag? That is when you, the difference is made. So that is kind of like, you know, when you, when you write a C program, okay? It's kind of like, you know, saying when you declare integers, 
it is ambiguous. Okay, an integer is neither signed or unsigned. It is just saying, oh, I'll give you a 32 bit, do whatever you want with it. But when you compare, then you have to tell the compiler and say, oh, I want a signed, oops, signed compare. I want a unsigned compare. It's only when you compare that you have to spell out how to treat the bit patterns that you are presenting to the comparison operator. Okay? But you don't do this in C and C++, because in C and C++, the variable itself already has the type, already indicates whether it is signed or unsigned. Okay? So when we get to those instructions, you will, I hope that you will remember what we talked about today, because that is one thing that tricks people, because if they think, oh, when I declare, the compiler already know, it already knows what type of you know, integer we're dealing with, not in assembly language programming. Okay? It's only when you need to use the result of a comparison, then you have to say, oh, how do we use the flags? All right, are there any questions up to this point? Can someone summarize what kind of flags we have talked about, which can indicate the result of a comparison? Let me scroll a little more to make sure everything is out of the way. Uh, borrow. Borrow, uh-huh. The moral flag is also known as the carry. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Less than the L flag. Uh huh. The carry. Carry. Well, carry is right here. Carry and borrow are the same. Sign flag. The sign flag. The sign flag. Okay. Very good. The sign flag and overflow. The overflow. And there's one more. Z flag. The Z flag. Very good. Okay. So these are the flags, quote unquote, the flags that your processor, the ALU can set and clear these flags for every subtraction operation. For every comparison operation, they will change these flags according to the result. Okay? But, the, but you don't use it until you say, oh, I need to look at these to determine where to continue execution. We'll get to those instructions. I'm just you know, talking a little bit ahead of time here. Do we have any questions about these flags? They are a part of the ALU. They are stored after the result, after the comparison is done, they are stored. But the next comparison will overwrite it. So you, you can only utilize the result like immediately after a compare instruction. Okay. Any questions about all of this stuff here? No questions? If there are no questions, I'm, I'm, I will go back to my processor and we'll do a few exercises with that, okay? These will all eventually be useful for the microcode engine, you know, which is based on your music box, okay? So we'll go ahead and talk about the control unit. And I don't think I have it downloaded I don't have it saved where uh, it is permanent, so I'm going to have to save it again. So, and then we'll start up the emulator. to do is try to perform operations that you already know in C and C++. Okay. But we'll do it in this particular you know, manner. So we'll go ahead and say, hmm, this is location 0, and we'll, I'll inject a value into location 0. So I'm going to inject a uh, 6E into location 0. I want to copy the value of 6E into a register. So what do I do to say, okay, I want to go to location zero and copy that value into a register? Hmm? And I'll, 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 I'll even specify the register, okay? So this way, you know, we know exactly what we're doing. 
So on a separate sheet or in a separate document, we'll, uh, this is documenting what I plan to do. So I want register, the registers are number, well, they're numbered, register zero to register seven because we've got eight of those. So let's say I want register five to get um, the content of location zero. Okay, I'm just using pseudo C notation here. Um, without all the typecasting. Does everybody understand you know, the C notation here, what, what the asterisk means? What does asterisk as a unary operator represent? The reference, right? So I'm directing zero. Well, normally you cannot do this with a C compiler because with a C compiler, zero is known as a what? It's zero, it's a value, it, which is an integer. Well, I actually take it back. Zero can take on, you know, integer and also quantum values, you know, at the same time. So I'm gonna, you know, I'll just be, I'll cast it first. That will always work. So this way, I'm casting zero instead of an integer. Now it is um, the address of a character. Well, with the address of a character, you can always dereference it. So the outer dereference operation is just dereferencing it, which means I go to location zero, copy that byte into register five. That's what I want to do. Okay. So now we want to exercise all the plus and all the control lines and see what how we can do this. Okay. All right. Um, how do we get this done? The first thing we need to do is to get the memory module to output the content at location zero. Is that okay? How do we get this done? Okay. Well, before we do that, we better set set up the address bus first, right? So we want to look at the address bus and say, okay, who is driving the address bus? Based on what you're seeing on the screen right now, who is driving this bus? Nobody. Look, if nobody is driving the bus, that's a bad situation especially when it's a school bus, <laughs> right? So this is not good. I want somebody to, to be driving the bus. So how do I, where do I look to find out, you know, okay, who can, who can possibly drive the bus, the address bus? Ah, here's a mux, okay? And again, what is a mux? What does it do? <coughs> it's a multiplexer. It is a switch. It's a switch, it's a selector, okay? So the mux here is basically saying, there's only one output, but if I can choose any one of the four possible inputs. There are actually four. One is not used, okay? So we have one output here, one, excuse me, one input here, one input here, one input here, and one input here. This one connects to the result of the ALU, okay? Well, I don't think the ALU is outputting anything that is useful at this point, so I'm not gonna use it. The other one down here is driven by the program counter. Sometimes it is a program counter, and sometimes it's the address register, okay? It depends on the scenario. But in most cases, it is the address register that will be driving the uh, address bus. So what do I need to do to say that, hey, let's hook up the output of the address register to the input, to become the output of the mux. What do I have to do? change the driver select, and how should I change, what should I change it to? Two, okay? The value two, which is one zero. Okay, so I set it to one zero. The address register has the right address already, so we're good. So now we click on the address bus again, and somebody is driving it, okay? It's all zeros, which is good, okay? Next, what do we need to do? The, we are already specifying the right address to the memory module. But the memory module is not paying attention. Why is it not paying attention? The select pin is low. Okay, RAM cell is low, so the RAM your module is not even paying attention. Then you say, okay, RAM module, pay attention. Ah, it's paying attention now. But right now, the output is, is still undriven. Okay, the memory module is not driving the output because the load <coughs> pin is a low. The load pin says if load if one, load memory to output, which means we have to turn it into a one. 
So we put a one here, and the output should not be driving. If I click on this wire, you can see that, ah, it is driving. In fact, you can look at the bit value here. 0, 1, 1, 0 is a 6, 1, 1, 1, 0 is an E. So the content of location 0 is now driving the data bus out of the memory module. But I don't want this to be just sitting on the bus, you know, because when you hop on the bus, what do you do? You want to get to a destination. Nobody hops on the bus just to be on the bus. Well, when I was a kid, I liked doing that. But, um, but you get to run to a bus to end up at a certain destination, right? So this data, 6E, needs to go somewhere. Where do we want it to go again? Let's switch back to the uh, instruction. We want it, it to go to register 5. Where does register 5 live? In the register bank. But if you want to get anything into the register bank, you have to use the register in port, okay? Which is, there's, there's only one. And right now it is already driven correctly because the mux is defaulting to zero. And zero is the actual data bus from the RAM. So we are already set up here. So that's good. We want it to store into register five, okay? So the selection pin of the input register needs to set to five, which is one, zero, one. There's a few more things that we need to do. Register in enable has to be a one to tell the register bank and say, hey, go ahead and store whatever is in the register in port into one of the registers. And register in select is specifying which, which register will store this value. And then what do we do next? We have to store it. How do you store something into a register, which is basically a multi-bit edge-sensitive D flip-flop. Uh, clock, clock, right? Yeah. Okay, so we need to clock it. All right, so we go to clock, give it a rising edge. This will store it already, but the clock always needs to go back to the zero, so I'm gonna clock it back to zero. So now, when I go to the registers, register five should now have the content of 60. Let's see if that is the case. You register bank, go to five. In fact, it does have the content of 6E. So that's good. Now I want to do something a little bit more funky. I want this 6E to specify the address where I will store the content of register two. So let me write down what I want to do in pseudo C code, and then we'll go ahead and do it. I think we have enough time to do this. Okay, so what I want to do is to turn around and say um, the content of register 5 is now being used as an address. And I want to store the content of register 2 into that memory location. Is that okay? Does everybody understand the kind of pseudo C notation? Is that okay? All right, okay, so once, one more time, I'm using the content of register five and treat it as an address. I want that to tell the memory module and say, hey, I want that location. What do I want to do with that location? Whatever is stored in register two, store it into that memory location. This is what I want to do, okay? So we'll go back to our simulator and say, okay, what kind of you know stuff do we need to do to make that happen? Okay, so let's figure this out. The first thing we need to do is to specify this as the address bus, because you know, that has to go out somehow. <laughs> so let's go back to this uh, simulation, and we want to go back to the main screen. Okay. All right, we are not storing anything into the register bank anymore. Better turn this off. So the first thing we need to do is to say, okay, I need one of the registers to drive the address bus. How can that happen? So what we do is we click on the address bus, which I think is this one. Nope, it's this one here. This is the address bus. I want that to connect to one of the outputs of the registers. This is the output of one register. 
uh, one of the registers. This is the output, potential output of the other register. Do you guys see the connection? So by turning the mux to one, I can now say, hey, whatever is being, the, whatever is the output of the register bank, at least you know, with um, register out, reg one out, is going to go into the mux. So that's what I'll do first. So I'm going to say, okay, let's turn the mux into zero one. So whatever is here is also going to be the output. But wait, there's nothing here. Nobody is driving this particular line because why do you think nobody is driving it? We have no registers selected. Well, and they're always selected. Something is always being selected, but the output enable is off. So we have to first select which register. Which register, again, specifies the location? Five. The memory location, five. Okay, so we put 101 here, and then we say, let's enable it. Let's check again. Ah, now this is specifying 6E, and this is also specifying 6E. So now we have selected and you know, programmed the address bus correctly. Uh, what are we doing with that location here? We want whatever is in reg2 to be there. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and put some non-zero value into reg2 so that you know, it shows the result. So we'll just go ahead and put some random value here. We'll just say it is 70. Okay. How do you store something into RAM from the perspective of the memory module? It has to be presented into the data bus. Okay. Well, before I do anything else, I'm going to deselect the memory module because until I'm ready, I'm just going to say, hey, don't pay attention until everything is ready. I'm also going to turn off the load because if, if the LD pin is high, the memory module can still be driving the data bus. I don't want to have two different sources driving the same bus. How do we, what is the phrase to describe the situation when you have multiple components trying to specify the value of one single line? Sure. It's called a fight, right? So in this case, we end up with a bus fight, which is not good. You don't want, you don't want, any, you don't want any fights to break out in a school bus. So a lot of things that we do here, you know, applies to school buses as well. <clears throat> so which part is it when you get beat up and your lunch money is taken? That would probably fall into the case of a bus fight when one component is stronger than the, than the other. <laughs> is that about right? All right, so we, tra we track down the data bus here and say, okay, how can we drive the data bus? Ah, perfect. See, in this case, one of the outputs of the register bank can drive the data bus while the other one is driving the address bus. So that's great. So we have to specify which one, which is register two. So this particular one has to select register two, turn on the output enable, and then we check the data bus and see whether it is the value that we want it to be. This is 7D, 0111 is seven, 1101 is D. So this is the correct value. So now we have connected, we have specified the correct address, which is 6E. Uh, we have specified the correct content to override that location, which is 7D. What is left to do is just to exercise the control lines of the <coughs> memory module and say, hey, memory module, wake up, pay attention. Ah, as soon as it pays attention, it is already going to the location and saying, okay, I know you want to do something about this location. In fact, I have already specified what I want to do to that, lo to that location because RAM load, R-A-M-L-D, is a zero, which means I am going to perform a write operation to the memory module, okay? But how come it's not changing? Because it is also an edge-sensitive device. I have to clock it. Okay, so the clock line has to go from zero to one in order for that location to actually change. So we'll track down the clock, which is all the way up here, and go a little further. And we say, hi, and the memory location should change by now, okay, 7D. And then we go back here, because clock should always you know, cycle, so once it goes to one, you know, then it has to go back to zero. 
and we have just stored the content of one register to a location in memory, and the address of that location is based on one of the other registers. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay. We are running out of time, or just about running out of time. So this is the kind of stuff that your music box will eventually end up doing, okay? Flipping all the bits, you know, changing, you know, the control lines, um, controlling the switches, the multiplexers, specifying, okay, which one of the input becomes the actual output, turn on the enable, turn off the enable, blah, 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 and do it in a coordinated way in order to you know, perform these operations. But the most important part, you know, this part is kind of important, but the other important part of today's lecture, the, at least you know, the end of this one, is the understanding of these kind of pseudo C notation. I know it is not actually C notation, but this is the closest I can get to connect concepts of this class to something that you already understand. So is everybody <coughs> comfortable with these notations? When you read data sheets of processors, they do have a specific language to describe what is going on inside the processor, but it's kind of cryptic and it's hard to do in using a notepad. This is really kind of close to you know, what needs to be expressed, so I'll be continuing to use this notation kind of throughout the semester. Um, in the next class, we'll start to get into actual programming using assembly language. So I will, you know, in the lab time, I'm going to turn on all of those uh, pages because I think they're still pointing to the old server, which doesn't work. So I will turn on all of those pages, and over the weekend, we can start to read the additional ones. I'll point out which ones before I you know, have the chance to turn it on, so that you know kind of where we are talking about. It's after signed numbers, and it's after non-integer representation. We'll get back to these things too, by the way. It is assembly language programming. And the first one, or the first link here, that, that is actually relevant is everything modes and memory allocation. That might, yeah, that's not going to work because I have not changed the links yet. So it's not working now, you know, but as soon as I get to the lab, I'm going to change all those you know, URLs. So they would also they would all go live. Okay. Any questions? No questions. All right. If there are no questions, I will be over at the lab. I'll be uploading tonight's uh, lecture and fixing the URLs. All one of them. Hmm? What? All one of them. Yeah, one of them. <laughs> so I have.